to our next episode of What's a Prof. Good day, Walter. We are back once more. Yes. With a continuation of our previous story. I'm looking forward to it. Well, you open up for us, then we can get right into it. Our Heavenly Father, as we head for the times that we have been longing for, I pray that you will enlighten our minds and be with us in our deliberations. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Yes, so you can give us maybe a quick recap. Yes, we were speaking about Babylon and the doctrine of the serpent. And we looked at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, where the serpent said unto the woman, Did God really say? And then he questioned whether God really said that they weren't supposed to eat of the fruit and that you would die. You will surely not die, he said. Yes. And what was the other thing that he said? You shall be as gods. gods. And the third thing he said, you shall know good and, and evil. evil. And then we looked at the Bible and we looked at all the places where God said, and then the question is, did God really say that? Do people still believe that today? Yes. So we're going into the doctrine of Babylon and we discussed the first question. Did God really say? And the woman said, God said that we were not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, and the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And he said, you will surely not, not die. die. And we saw that that is the doctrine of the world today. The world, whether it's in spiritism, or in Catholicism, or in Protestantism, believes the serpent rather than God. Yes. I just want to also say that the immortality of the soul not merely means that you live and go to heaven after you die, it also means you go, you can, like they say, can go to hell. Either way, it stays immortal. If you burn in hell for always, Correct. it's still immortal. It's still immortality, but God said that you will die, mm. meaning a permanent obliteration. They will consume away. Like smoke, they will consume away. They will be as though they never were. Now, the second lie was, ye shall be as gods. Now, we know that the New Age movement preaches that. And uh, there are even books on how to become like Christ. Helen Schuchman's, Schuchman's book, for example, tells you that you can become Christ. But let's look at this issue again and see what they teach. Here's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is from Vatican.va. So this is the official webpage of the Roman Catholic Church. And Article 460 states the following. The Word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. Now, I, I don't really have a problem with that because we have to be partakers of the divine nature in the sense that we must emulate God's character. For this is why the Word became man and the Son of God became the Son of Man, so that man, by entering into communi communion with the Word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a Son of God. For the Son of God became man, so that we might become God. That's with a capital G. That's an astounding statement. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us share us in His divinity, assumed our nature so that He made man, might make men gods. Now, when we look at the New Age movement and its origins, uh, I actually have a lecture on the New Age movement somewhere, then we can see that the Gen Jesuits were also very instrumental in that particular movement. I will put it in as uh, it's in total onslaught. Oh, that's correct, yes. So, is this something that is just there in the Catechism, or is it something that is uh, further than that, or goes further than that? 
Here is an article and it's quite a recent article. It's from May 13, 2016 and it's from Zenit, which is a Roman Catholic source. And the issue is interview. Humans become God? Yes, it's Catholic theology. And doesn't Catholic scholars and theologians examine what the process of deification means in their respective areas of study? The first generations of Christians saw in their new lives in Jesus Christ a way to transcend all the limitations of sin and death and become new creatures. St. Peter expresses this, this is participating in the divine nature. While St. Athanasius stated it succinctly 300 years later, God became a human so humans could become God. Now they will try and rationalize that, but it's very hard to rationalize a statement like that. It's pretty blatant. Yes. Deification of humans sounds pretty new age. Could you give us a brief overview of what this concept means in Catholic theology? Now we'll see what Father McConey says. Far from being new age, deification is one of the most ancient ways of explaining salvation in Jesus Christ. Christianity is a two-act play. In the first act, God becomes human, but that is just the beginning. In the second act of the play, we humans are to become like God. He's careful in the way he puts it. More loving, more joyful, incorruptible and immortal. Think of a piece of iron. Alone it is hard and cold, but in a fire it takes on a new glow, a new warmth and the malleability, but it never ceases to be iron. Look at section 460 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is a very central component of Catholicism. The difference between the Church's understanding of deification and the Mormon doctrine is that Catholics we believe we become partakers of the divine nature in Christ but never the possessors of the Godhead, which as far as I understand it is more in line with the Mormon view. Now it's interesting that the Mormon view of course was also influenced by the Jesuit de Smet, who was a personal friend of Joseph Smith. Do you, you also have a lecture that... It's part of the New Age movement. Yes. Yes, correct. I'll yeah. put that link in. Let's look at another aspect here. Seeking a promotion for the Virgin Mary. The world of today is in desperate need of a mother whispered Professor Mark Miraval as he sat behind his desk at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, carefully fingering a string of rosary beads. Half a world away, inside the Vatican, yet another enormous box arrived filled with petitions asking Pope John Paul II to exercise his absolute power to proclaim a new and highly debated dogma that the Virgin Mary is a co-redeemer with Jesus and cooperates fully with her son in the redemption of mankind. The title that they wanted for her is co-redemptrix and mediatrix. Now they never went that far because they thought Protestants would have a problem with this and in the ecumenical climate they didn't want to upended so they didn't go that far but I have newspaper clippings where it says that Pope John Paul is not averse to the idea that Mary can be even part of the Godhead. Sure. Uh, uh, in German it says eine göttliche Maria. A Mary. godly Mary. Yes correct. So this is rather fascinating so if it, if it applies to one human can't it apply to all? Okay. So in addition to ordinary Catholics, Mr. Morales received support from 550 bishops and 42 cardinals. So, you know, what determines whether something becomes a dogma or not? Support by humanity well, or the word of God? Uh, yes, well, according to this, uh, the support by humanity. Yeah, so, so the, the more the petitions you have. Majority rules. Correct. 
So it even included Cardinal John O'Connor and Mother Teresa before their deaths. Along the way, his movement has laid bare a deep-seated conflict between wildly popular devotion to the Virgin Mary and the efforts of the established church to keep that devotion in check. Although it has the support of at least 12 cardinals in Rome, others fear that its acceptance would cause a major schism amongst Catholics and set back efforts at ecumenism. So, and the dogma would be an infallible proclamation by the Pope. That would make it truth, right? According to them. So even if it is contrary to the Bible, it will also provoke renewed debate over the role of the Pope's power in modern society. Now, Pope John Paul II actually has made no secret of his devotion to Mary, and the present Pope exactly the same, and the previous one, Ratzinger. Totus tuus, which in Latin means totally yours, is his motto, in which he dedicates his papacy to her. He also credits Mary with saving his life during 1981 assassination attempt and with hastening the fall of communism. Now, according to the scripture, where's Mary? In the grave. Sleeping, waiting for the resurrection. So, this is rather strange. He has used the phrase co-redemptrix six times in his papacy to describe Mary which has led petitioners to hope that during his lifetime he will proclaim her co-redeemer. So they actually believe it, but for the sake of expediency they haven't proclaimed it. Convention, the largest denomination of Protestants in the United States, expressed alarm at the suggestion that Mary might be a co-redeemer. Such a view is clearly heretical, he said. In order to be a redeemer, it would require a person to be perfect. But then, of course, Rome has declared the Immaculate Conception that she was perfect from birth. Yes. Now, actually from the moment of conception, that she was totally without sin. So how did God do that? By a decree. Now my question is, if God by decree could declare Mary sinless, yes. couldn't he do it for you? Yes. Well, why is he not doing it for you? Is it uh, <laughs> a selfish act on his to only convey it to one person and not to all? So is it biblical? No. Why did he declare Mary immaculate and why didn't he de um, st declare Jesus as immaculate? Yes, that's an interesting point. You see, they reason that in order for Jesus to be born out of a human being, that person had to be without sin in order to bring forth such a Redeemer who was Immaculate. So in actual fact, in Catholic doctrine, the Immaculate, sinless nature of Jesus is derived from his mother. Okay. Because she was Immaculate. Now here's the question. Beca or the, uh, the, the question is now, how do I approach Jesus? So the answer is through Mary. Yes. She becomes the mediator. And therefore, she must be the co-redemptrix. That is their reasoning. Okay. But the Bible says that Mary was born under the law, yes. which means under the condemnation of the law, she was just like anyone else. So this is an interesting point. We certainly don't believe she was God. Some liberal Protestants have long argued that the Catholic Church has used the symbol of Mary to restrict opportunities for women and as a way of instilling women's obedience to the teachings of the Church. And Bishop John Spong, one of the most controversial figures in the Episcopal Church, now retired, says Christians need a feminine symbol for God, but that such a symbol should be created by women, not a bunch of men sitting around in Rome in their frocks. Well, nevertheless, the, the debate is interesting, but John Paul is on record as not being averse to the idea that Mary is divine. Now what about papal claims to divinity? Well, of course, there are numerous medieval papal claims. They were called Lord God the Pope. What can you make of me but God, said Pope Leo. Uh, so there are many, many statements where the pap papacy has claimed that they are gods. Mm. 
Pope Leo the Thirteenth said these things about the role of the papacy in the Roman Church. Our thoughts went out towards the immense multitude of those who are strangers to the gladness that filled all Catholic hearts. Some because they lie in absolute ignorance of the gospel, others because they dissent from Catholic belief, though they bear the name of Christians. This thought has been and is a source of deep concern to us, capitalized. Now remember, God said, let us, yes. capitalized, make man in our image. So by capitalizing it, they are applying deity to themselves. For it is impossible to think of such a large portion of mankind deviating, as it were, from the right path as they move away from us and not experience a sentiment of innermost grief. But since we hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. That's a fascinating statement. Here's another one from Pope Leo. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds therefore requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Now, what if the Roman pontiff teaches something which is diametrically opposed to what the Bible teaches? Then I have to choose who I'm worshipping, right? Yes. More recently, Pope John Paul II wrote that names like Holy Father are applicable to the Pope, even though calling him that is counter to the Gospel. I think we should read the quote out of his book. I happen to have his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and it's on page six, this quote. And he writes, Returning to your question, I would like to recall the words of Christ, together with my first words in St. Peter's Square. Be not afraid. Have no fear when people call me the Vicar of Christ. When they say to me, Holy Father, or Your Holiness, or use titles similar to these, which seem even inimical to the Gospel of Christ, who himself declared, Call no one on earth your Father. You have but one Father in heaven, do not be called master. You have but one master, the Messiah, Matthew 23, 9 to 10. That's astounding. He says, don't oppose it. It's right. They can call me that, even though it's against the Bible. Even though Jesus said don't. These expressions nevertheless have evolved out of a long tradition. Becoming a part of common usage, one must not be afraid of these words either. So you shouldn't be afraid if the Bible condemns it, because tradition upholds it. So who is higher, the Bible or tradition? Well, in their ranks. Absolutely. In 1996, he also gave his assent to calling the Pope Lord and mm. Christ on earth. We read, readily understand the devotion of St. Francis of Assisi for the Lord Pope, the daughterly outspokenness of St. Catherine of Siena towards the one whom she called sweet Christ on earth, the apostolic obedience and the Sentia cum ecclesia of St. Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuit founder, mm -hmm. And the joyful profession of faith made by St. Teresa of Avila, I am a daughter of the church. So the papacy clearly has no problem with deifying the general populace, but particularly themselves. Yes. Is um, the title Pontifex Maximus? Does that have anything to do with... The title the Pontifex God. Maximus was the original title of the Babylonian priesthood. Yes. And when the Medo-Persians conquered Babylon, then the Babylonian priesthood fled to Pergamos. 
and there they established a, a separate uh, kingdom, a priestly God kingdom, yes. where the high priest had the title Pontifex Maximus and he was worshipped as God. As God. It's interesting. Now the interesting thing is that the Medo-Persians never conquered that city. Mm -hmm. Neither did the Greeks. And the Romans, they never conquered it in a war. But the last king of Babylon, priest king, who had the title Pontifex Maximus, was King Attalus. And he bequeathed his title and everything that goes with it to the Roman emperor. And the Roman emperors never appropriated it. Mm -hmm. They they used the title, but they didn't use didn't deify themselves until you get to Julius Caesar. This is where the title Caesar comes from. And Julius Caesar had himself crowned as a reincarnation of, of the god Apollo, and he was to be deified. And from that day on, they had the title Pontifex Maximus, and they were gods. And they had to be worshipped. So there were temples erected for the Caesars and everybody had to worship the Caesar. The early Christians refused. And so they were thrown to the lions and to the gladiators yes. and they were crucified. And eventually when Rome then started dissipating and the Roman pontiff took the title mm -hmm. So the Bishop of Rome took the title Pontifex and its powers. So he became a god. And that title today still sits with the Pope. It is the original title of the King of Babylon. So in other words, anyone who has that title is the King of Babylon. And the Pope has it. Yes. Interesting is Twitter account is at Pontifex. Ah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So what was the third lie of the serpent? That you, in well, your own strength, would be able to determine between, between right and wrong. Yeah. Knowing good and evil. Yes. Here's Article 3 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. God created man a rational being, conferring on him the dignity of a person who can initiate and control his own actions. God willed that man should be left in the hands of his own counsel so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full blessed perfection by cleaving to him. The Bible says nobody seeks God. Here they say you seek God by yourself. So the Bible says no, God searches for you. The Catholic Church says, no, you search for God. God. This is the master of reversal. Everything is reversed. Here's an interesting article from the story of Protestantism by Holderstein Gale. It's a very famous book on Protestantism and it tells us that this debate even raged in the time of Martin Luther already. It became one of the points of dispute. It was John Eck, now Chancellor of the University of in Ingolstadt, had attacked Luther's opinion in a work entitled The Obelisks. To this account, the pamphlet had been issued by Andrew Bodenstein, Andreas Bodenstein in German, better known as Karlstadt, who was now challenged by Eck to one of those public disputations which played no mean part in controversy in the days when there was no newspaper press. But before the day fixed for the disputation, arrived Eck must needs publish 13 theses in which he plainly attacked Luther and thus the professor's self-tied bonds were loosed and Luther himself was drawn into the war of words with Eck which waged at Leipzig in July 1519. Now look at the issue. The disputation is important for it marks a distinct stage in the drawing of the line between Rome and the reformers. The question of free will was first debated. Mm. Dr. Eck and his friends maintained 
that man without the aid of the Holy Spirit and simply of himself has the power to choose what is spiritually good. There's the Catholic doctrine. And to obey God. Luther and Karlstadt, on the other hand, contended that until his nature is renewed by the Spirit, man cannot love and serve God. Nobody seeks God, says the Bible. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, Pretty what they say is... So, but we have to find it in modern theology, right? Yes. Because this is important. Because remember what we were discussing. Mm -hmm. We were discussing what is Babylon. Mm. And why do we have to flee from Babylon? Babylon. And we were discussing the components of Babylon. There was the dragon, which is spiritism. Yes. There was the beast, which is Catholicism. And then there's the false prophet, which arises out of the USA. Yes. So it is Protestantism, Protestantism. that has returned to its Babylonian yes. origins. So this is what Martin Luther believed then. Yes, so you want to get to the root of it and see how it's applicable so, today. So yeah, there's no evidence here that Protestantism is part of Babylon. No. The only thing that is part of Babylon at this stage is the dragon, who's the devil himself, and spiritism through his spirits, and, and Catholicism. Yes. But there's no evidence that Protestantism is involved. Now, this is a, a quote from Richard M. Gula, Reason Informed by Faith. Now, uh, he's a Jesuit teacher. So this is what the Jesuits believe. Remember, when a Jesuit publishes something, it is on behalf of the Jesuit general because he may do nothing without the consent of his Jesuit general. So this is the idea of the Roman Catholic Church at its core. So what does he say? Since Vatican II, a significant broad consensus on moral theological literature suggests that the human person is the most appropriate point of departure for elaborating on the meaning of morality. In general, and for providing the fundamental criteria which are necessary for dealing with specific moral questions. So you don't start with scripture, you start with man. To say that the person adequately considered is the norm of morality does not dethrone God and raise the human person to the level of the supreme values. That's he adds as an afterthought. But let's see how it continues. One is always bound to follow the judgment of a properly informed conscience. The informing takes place in community. Do you find that interesting? Yes. By appealing to the various sources of moral wisdom, various sources, in the church, where's the moral criterion in the church? In the church, the magisterial is the source of moral authority. Now, what is the magisterial? That's the Pope and his yes. bishops. Hierarchy. The hierarchy of the church, they will determine what is right. Its teaching is very important, though not exclusive, factor in the formation of conscience and in one's moral judgment. Then he says there's an appeal to authority as part of responsible living. In appealing to an authority, we believe that it will be more correct about this question than we will. So the moral authority will be more correct than we are. Or than anyone else to whom we might appeal. So if I want to know what is morally right, I have to ask the church, mm. not the Bible. No, the church. No, and it takes place in community, which means the community can inform me what is right. Mm. So if a certain lifestyle which is contrary to the Bible is acceptable in the community, yeah. then that becomes the moral value and not the Bible. Mm -hmm. However, the great advantage of having an institutionalized authority in the magisterium is that it provides a structure which can bring together in a cooperative and complementary way the experience and insights of various perspectives so as to reach as complete an expression of truth about moral life as possible. So where do you determine the truth? In the magisterium. Hmm. Where does the Bible say do you determine the truth? In the Word. Thy Word is truth. truth. 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life. All thy commandments are truth. truth. Okay. Can you see a conflict developing here? Yes. Moreover, in the midst of so many conflicting voices telling us what to do in so many diverse communities, projecting images of what makes life worthwhile, we are fortunate to have the magisterium to teach in moral matters. The primary responsibility of the magisterium is to help us to understand the gospel for our times and to foster our assimilation of its basic value, the formula. No infallible decision conscience decides is a complete distortion of the real function of conscience. Conscience needs to be informed. For Catholics to make a decision of conscience with indifference to or in spite of the magisterium would be forfeiting one's claim to be acting as a loyal Catholic and according to a properly informed conscience. So in other words, you have to make all your moral decisions through the thinking of the hierarchy of yes. the church. So actually your conscience is dictated by them. Right. Now, the name of his book is interesting to me. Uh, he's, a, he's an author of many books. The, the name of the book is Reason Informed by Faith. Now, what is higher, reason or faith in this equation? If your reason is informed by faith, then your reason is higher than your faith. Right? So they put human reason above faith. But faith can inform your reason, according to this title. Yeah. Now, if I had to make a scriptural title, then I would reverse it. I would say, faith informed by reason. Because the Bible says, faith is the highest one, because without faith it is impossible to please God. Right? Yes. So faith must be the first objective. Faith in what? Faith in God's Word. Yes. Faith in Jesus Christ as my Redeemer. That is the first thing. And that sets the parameter and my reason can inform my faith, but it cannot uproot my faith. With faith you'll accept God really said. Correct. And then reason will bring into that. Otherwise, when you put reason on top... Then you can say, did God really say? Yes. Very good point. Very good point. So, the judgment of conscience properly formed takes seriously that we are limited in our personal experience and vision of what is good, but that we can learn from the broader experience and vision to which we belong. The official teaching of the magisterium can open us to that broader experience and provide that broader vision. The key text for understanding a loyal response to magisterial teaching is in Lumen Gentium. So it's a papal encyclical. What does it say? In matters of faith and morals, the bishops speak in the name of Christ and the faithful accept their teaching and adhere to it with religious assent of soul. That means, I agree. What it says, I will do. This religious submission of will and of mind must be shown in a special way to the authentic teaching authority of the Roman pontiff, even when he is not speaking ex cathedra. Sure. That means that if the Pope says something, I will set my mind aside and accept what he says. Yes. I will become brain dead. Mm. Now, this is a Jesuit speaking, and the Jesuit oath says that even, well, not the oath, but one of the statements is that even if, if God should give you a dog as a general, you would not refuse to obey him. Yes. What is that statement? Um, et cadaver. Et cadaver, yeah. yeah In other words, you will obey like a corpse. Yes. Like a corpse. You will have no mind of your own. Now, did God ever bypass our freedom of choice? No. He came, that's why he died for us. Aha. Uh -huh. Why did Jesus die? 
so that we can have freedom of choice. Yes, he could have forced us, he could have made us um, slaves like this and told us you will obey and uh, I'll be the puppet master. No, he wants willful obedience by choice. So the question is, what does religious assent or submission of will and mind mean in moral matters? This is Richard Gula asking the question, not me. Religious assent or submission, this teaching means that such effort and appropriation are motivated by the conviction that Jesus has commissioned the church to teach and that the Spirit guides the church in truth. Francis A. Sullivan, an ecclesiologist from the Gregorian University of Rome, so in there he's quote, one Jesuit quoting another Jesuit, has analyzed this expression in his masterful work, Magisterium. Teaching authority in the Catholic Church and offers this summary statement of its meaning. As I understand it then, to give the required obsequium religiosium. Now, we get the word obsequious from this. Now, what does the word obsequious mean? It means to be totally submissive in religious matter. Totally submissive in religious matter. To the teaching of the ordinary magisterium means to make an honest and sustained effort to overcome any contrary opinion I might have and to achieve a sincere assent of mind to a middle position has been expressed in the official text of the 1978 National Catholic Directory sharing the light of faith. In other words, it is the task of the catechesis to elicit assent, to agree to, in all the church teachers. So if the Bible says you will die, and the church says you will not die, you must believe the church. church. For the church is the indispensable guide to the complete richness of what Jesus teaches. When faced with the question which pertain to dissent from non-infallible teachings of the church, it is important for the catechist to keep in mind that the presumption is always in favor of the magisterium. So if I have a contrary opinion, I better change it. Mm. Vatican II taught us the proper relationship of conscience of magisterial authority in moral matters in the way it affirmed the primacy of conscience. A particular significant position is found in the Declaration on Religious Freedom where we read, in the formation of our consciences, the Christian faithful ought carefully to attend to the sacred and certain doctrine of the Church. An earlier ending of this text read, ought to form their conscience according to the teachings of the Church. The rendering according to was rejected for being overly restrictive. Conclusion, the Catholic preference in wanting to be guided by an expert or a voice of authority is to turn to the magisterium. Although no external authority can ever replace conscience, conscience cannot be properly formed without the help of authority. Now who is that authority? Well, the magisterium, yeah. The magisterium, and who's the head of the magisterium? The Pope. And he's the only one who speaks infallibly. Infallibly. So here you have the whole kabang. You have knowing good and evil, conscience. So let's go to the present general of the Jesuits and ask him how he sees the function of the Society of Jesus. What is the commission, according to the Bible, of anyone who follows Jesus Christ? To make disciples of other people. Ah, go ye into all the world and teach. Preach the? Or preach the gospel ah. to every tongue and tribe and nation. Okay, what is the gospel? It's the good news yes. of salvation. Mm. Let's see what their good news is. To show the way to God through the spiritual exercises and discernment. So the spiritual exercises are exercises, as we have discussed in previous ones, where basically you open your mind to the spirit world and your communication with the spirit world becomes natural. Mm. And you must use all your senses. You must use your sense of smell, your sense of sight, 
So you imagine yourself in a position mm -hmm. and then you actually move in your imagination into that position mm -hmm. so that all your senses become affected. You so to put yourself in the situation, you smell how it is there, Correct. you hear. And uh, if you go to the history of Protestantism, then you will see that this is recorded by the historians of Protestantism, that the difference between Jesuit theology and biblical theology is that the one is based on spiritism, which is dragon theology, because you are actually communicating and it becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not, not seen. seen. And now it becomes very dangerous. It's exceedingly dangerous. When you get to biblical, uh -huh. ex they put the disguise of the biblical exercises on top of this. And then what becomes the norm? The scripture or the experience? Well, most of the time the experience. Virtually all Actually, the time. all the time. Because it's a distorted explanation. They use meditation. Yes. Biblic, uh, Christian meditation. But actually it's another form of spiritual exercises. It's a spiritual exercise. Meditation in, in the biblical sense is studying the word of God and assessing the meaning of what God is saying and praying that God will enlighten your mind through the Holy Spirit. Not in this situation. So the spiritual exercises are exactly that, spiritism. They are dragon theology. To walk with the poor, the outcast of the world, those whose dignity has been violated in a mission of reconciliation and justice. So this is social justice. The gospel is to go to part of the world or the whole world? The whole world. Yes. The poor will be more likely to accept it because they haven't got that many strings attaching them to this world. But the gospel has to go to everyone. Yes. And to accompany young people in the creation of a hopeful future. Does the gospel differentiate between young and old? No. Did Jesus ever differentiate between young and old? No. Did he separate them at his meetings? No. Did he tell them to march for a particular cause? No. Um, it's just interesting. The, these points that you've mentioned now comes from the general of the Jesuits. Yes. But if you remember the previous um, episode, we had the document of Jubilee for the Earth. Yes. That was brought up, put up by Protestants. And that was full of spiritual exercises. And young people. All of this was there. Rioting or, no, sorry. Uh, protest, pr um, protest protesting. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> And then to collaborate in the care of our home. So this is the gospel. To perform spiritualistic exercises of Loyola, which will separate you from God. They are not from God. They are from another source. Yeah, because eventually, just a, a simple example, if in your spiritual ex exercises, you feel that there's no need to keep all the commandments, for instance, and you've been shown through this exercises that this is true, then you go with that. And what if you have discussions with Catholic saints that come to you during your spiritualistic experience and your ecstasy? Uh, what if Mary appears to you? What if Saint whoever appears to yes. you? The Bible says those people are asleep, waiting in the dust for the resurrection. Mm. Then who are you talking to? You're talking to a demon. Exactly. Now, um, my other question is, on these four points over here, where is the gospel of Jesus Christ? No way. Is it anywhere? I the, cannot see it anywhere. They've even got on the fourth point, your Gaia climate worship. change. Climate change? Climate change, Gaia, Gaia worship, worship, Mother Earth. Yeah, there's, there's no gospel of Jesus Christ here. So how they can call themselves the Society of Jesus is beyond me. Then he says they are not preferences. We have followed the Holy Spirit. Which Holy Spirit? Definitely not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. It must be one of those other birds yes. that the Bible referred to. 
who has guided and inspired us, we receive them confirmed by the Pope, trusting like Ignatius and the first companions that he is the one who has the best vision of the needs of the world and of the Church. In other words, the one who will tell me what is right and what is wrong and has the best needs of the world and of the Church at heart is the Pope. The universal apostolic preferences will help us to overcome every form of self-centeredness and corporatism so that we may become authentic collaborators in the Lord's mission. Which Lord? The Lord Pope or the Lord Jesus Christ? which we share with so many people inside and outside the church. The preferences are an opportunity for us to feel that we are the least society in collaboration with others. It sounds so humble, but there's no gospel. Mm. If we go to this book, Babylon the Great, there are some interesting quotes as to how people viewed the Jesuit order. Uh, and here is a statement in this book. The secret Illuminati organization was hidden, guiding hand behind the brutal French Revolution. And we are on the verge of a new revolution in our time. A lot of the um, people in America, actually in the articles and news articles and so on, like, there's a lot of mentioning that oh, this is like the, the French Revolution. It is a social revolution and it's like the French Revolution during which 300,000 people were massacred in a godless orgy of violence. The rage by the Jesuits and their reconstituted Illuminati culminated in 1798 with the capture of the Pope himself. Napoleon's general Berthier invited Rome, took the Pope Pius VI prisoner and held him until his death. Now, the Roman Catholic Church there for a while banned the Jesuits but they paid a heavy price for it. And then the Roman Church had learned its lesson. And in 1814, the Jesuits were restored as a Catholic order by Pope Pius VII. By the way, with the proclamation that they may never be banned again. Sure. Okay. Interesting, eh? It is. John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1816, I'm not happy about the rebirth of the Jesuits. Swarms of them will present themselves under more disguises ever taken by even the chief of the Bohemians as printers, writers, publishers, school teachers, etc. If ever an association of people deserved eternal damnation on this earth and in hell, it is the society of Loyola. Yet with our system of religious liberty, we can but offer them a refuge. Thomas Jefferson answered Adams, like you, I object to the Jesuits' establishment, which makes light give way to darkness. If you think of all the Jesuit colleges in the United States alone these days, then uh, these words have certainly come true. Yes. And it's actually surprising that we have prominent people that try and dissect and say, um, okay, this guy's, this one, this person studied there, but that doesn't necessarily make him a Jesuit. Now, who no. are you to, to decide if he's a Jesuit? Why would you want to go to an institution that's going to if feed you, you with poison? If you know this is what they, like, they're going to teach you. Exactly. Now, it's interesting that they come under many disguises. Printers, writers, publishers, school teachers. What about Protestants? Haven't they infiltrated Protestant churches? Why are Protestant churches today preaching Ignatian theology? Obviously, they've lost the plot. If they can write documents like that document we discussed last time, yes. then they have become part of Babylon. Yes. In 1835, Samuel Morse, the great inventor of the telegraph, echoed the concerns, concerns of Jefferson and Adams. He described the Jesuits and their threat to the United States as follows. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? If any are ignorant, let them inform themselves of their history without delay. No time is to be lost. Their workings are before you in everyday events. They are a secret society. 
a sort of Masonic order with super added features of the most revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. They are not confined to one class in society. They are not merely priests or priests of one religious creed, you see. They mm. infiltrate others. They are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession and no profession. Having no outward badge in this country by which to be recognized, they are about in all your society. They can assume any character, that of angels of light or ministers of darkness, to accomplish their one great end, the service upon which they are sworn to start at any moment, in any direction and for any service commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community or country, by the ordinary ties which bind men and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff. We have Jesuit theology everywhere. The churches are preaching it. In the ecumenical movement it is being practiced. We should, according to the scripture, have nothing to do with it. Yes. Come out of her, my people. So, my next question would be, how does this influence the use of scripture? Pre-critical use of scripture. This is Richard M. Guler speaking again. The Catholic moral tradition has laid claim to two sources for acquiring moral knowledge. Scripture and natural law. So they acknowledge scripture yes. and natural law. But now, because it has been so concerned with finding a common ground for moral life with all people, which all people could endorse, Catholic tradition has given prominence to natural law as the primary sources of moral knowledge. So not what the scripture says is important. What is important is what is moral value in society. Natural law. Natural law. What occurs naturally amongst peoples, even if they have no scriptures? That's more important than the scriptures. So you don't go and do what the Bible says. Make disciples of men and teach them. When I became a Protestant and I called the Catholic priest to my house and I said, could you please explain this to me in the Bible? Why do you people say this and this and the Bible says? His words were, and he was a Catholic priest. Mm. I am not into scripture. That solved it for me. While it gives the appearance of a biblical grounding to moral theology, proof texting really does not allow scripture to enter the fabric of moral theological reflection. Scripture has no part in it. Mm. This is Roman Catholic teaching. Now my question. Can we say that this is a Christian institution? No. No. You cannot. You cannot. It's not a Christian institution. We'll see later why it's not Christian. Because it denies every tenet of the Bible. Everyone. So they use scripture where it suits them, but sideline it everywhere else. Because of their being subject to historical conditioning, biblical text must be interpreted in order to be applied to contemporary situations. In other words, the scripture is not the same yesterday, today and forever. If it said something in the past, well then it might mean something else today. Yes. So God is not a God of consistency. No. It was written for that time today. We're living in modern times. It has to be adjusted. Is this taking your own way to heaven? Yes. Is this yes. Babylonian? Yes. Anybody who follows this becomes you, a Babylonian. Are you part of Babylon? Mm. That document that we read. Yes, that. Was it biblical or was it Babylonian? Definitely Babylonian. So when the Bible says come out of Babylon, what does that mean? You must leave that system. System. And all the teachings. Now here, yeah, this is interesting. Exegetical task. The exegetical task seeks to determine what the text meant in its original setting. What did it mean then? 
Doesn't Paul have the same reality in mind when he condemns homosexuality as we have in mind when we use the term in the light of our understanding of psychology and anthropology? Okay, so who will determine what it means? Paul or our understanding of the issue in the light of present day psychology and anthropology? What becomes the norm? The psychology and anthropology. Not the scriptures? No. This is not biblical. So, in this exegetical way, if it doesn't apply the same today in our understanding of things, then it's not. Then you reject then the Bible. Rejected. You reject the Bible. It doesn't mean anything. So, the Bible is what? You might as well put it on the shelf or use it as a doorstop, right? As a result, we need to be modest about the claims we make when appealing to the Bible in moral reflection. In other words, forget it. Mm. Then he talks about the hymenetical task. Hymenetical seeks to establish the meaning of the text for today. <laughs> That's so much nicer, because now I can just circumvent God. For example, we do not live consciously waiting for the imminent end of the world. Excuse me, why not? I am living and waiting for the end of the world, but they are not. Why not? Because the understanding of the word doesn't need them to be um, waiting for it right now. Jesus Christ said that the blessed hope of the church is the second coming. Mm. Catholicism teaches a millennialism. There is no millennium. It doesn't exist. It says so in the Bible, but who cares, right? Mm. So. Amillennialism means there is no millennium. So what is this kingdom that we're waiting for? The kingdom that they are waiting for is when the church rules. Mm. Now that's the same kingdom that the Jews were waiting for. They were waiting for the kingdom where they would be rulers of the world. Yes. But the kingdom that we are waiting for is the kingdom where God is the ruler of the world. Yes. So we're on opposite page here. If you believe the Bible, you are waiting for the coming of Christ. That is the blessed hope. I go to prepare a place to you for you, and when I go, I, c I will come again. Mm -hmm. To take you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and when I go, I will come again. Yes. To take you where I am also. Yes. That's the blessed hope. But no, these people say, we're not interested. This eschatological view influences the way we interpret the radical demands of Jesus' proclamation of the reign of God. You see, they believe the church will reign. Mm. And I believe Jesus Christ will reign. A big difference. And then also, and now what does the Protestants say? Well, it's interesting that uh, Martin Luther and the, the Lutheran church, like the Catholics, are amillennialists. They inherited it. It's, a, it's an Augustinian doctrine. So Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. So he hadn't, he hadn't realized this yet. And then uh, Hans Hut, remember? Yes. Hans Hut, he discovered in the time of the reformers mm -hmm. that Christ would come before the millennium and take his people away and then rule. So the Protestants and the Catholics were opposed to that doctrine, and Protestants actually killed Hans Hut. Yeah. And they burnt his bones, just like the Catholics had done to Wycliffe. Yes. Now the interesting thing is, this theology of the millennium and the coming of Christ remained a dispute. Many of the evangelicals believed in the reign of Christ down here, and all the nations down here get a second chance. Mm. So this is the great millennial hope that everybody was waiting for. But the Millerites taught, no, there will be a coming of Christ, the destruction of the wicked, the translation of the, the living in Christ, and the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And they will be taken, according to the scripture, to meet the Lord in the air yeah. and go for the millennium. But these people don't believe it, and the evangelicals, don't believe as the Catholics, but they also don't believe as the Bible believes. Yes. Okay. 
So, what is the theological task? Often in Catholic circles, the biblical foundations and theological presuppositions of a moral position have gone unexpressed in favor of a natural law argument. What happens naturally in nature is fine. So, if you, for example, have a society where whatever happens in terms of marriage relations or whatever, whatever that norm is, that applies, not what the scripture says. One extreme would make scripture the sole source of moral wisdom and discount any other. The Catholic tradition has never endorsed this position. Okay. So, in other words, are they for or against the scripture? Against it. All scripture is God-breathed, right? Yeah. And is for, for correction and, and teaching, teaching and all of these things. But here it is plainly rejected. So it, if you are one of those people that say, no, the Bible is my main source of morality and or the only source of morality, then you are an extreme. Absolutely, you're an extremist. Area. And you are against the magisterium. What was the punishment for being against the magisterium in the good old days of, of Catholic rule? Burned at the stake. Exactly. You're a heretic. And what will be the future punishment? The same. The same. In my treatment of formation of conscience, I pointed out that character is formed in community by committing our freedom to a particular object of loyalty. <sighs> You commit your freedom to a particular object of loyalty. Later on he defines that object of loyalty is of course the Pope. Mm -hmm. And when by internalizing the images, mm -hmm. the rituals, the traditions, etc. which the community has fashioned in order to carry the meaning attached to that object of loyalty. That's where you find your moral compass. I reject this with every fiber of my being. To me, the moral compass is the word of God. And like Martin Luther, I want to say, here I stand, I can do no other. Here's another book of his, Moral Discernment, where we're not going to read it all. It just says, shows that conscience is not a law unto itself, but must be formed in community by appealing to the sources of moral wisdom. So this is where the issue of common good mm, comes, comes in. in. That's where I, the first time they mentioned community, yes. this was the light that went So on. in other words, the Pope has clearly said, or the papacy has clearly said, that your freedom of religion is totally subject to the common good. Yes. So if the common good define something which is contrary to the Bible, then the common good takes precedence over the Bible. This is a dangerous issue. So really, Catholicism doesn't give you freedom of religion. No. So if you go back to the French Revolution, what did the community decide there? Yes, that God should be taken right out of the picture. Yes. And now there, this cathedral that stood for that travesty of justice where they enthroned the goddess of reason, yes. of, over, reason. of reason over the Bible, mm. that one burnt down. And now it has to be restored at great expense. Why? Do they want to enthrone reason again so they can be destroyed again? I'm wondering. Not that I will destroy it. I'll wait for God to do it. So let's look at some of the examples amongst thousands. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now if you want to know what the Reformers believed about this text, then you can go to Romanism and the Reformation by Grata and Guinness. That's Church of England. So well, that's not Adventism. And they will spell it out for you very clearly who the reformers thought this applied to. It applied to Roman Catholicism. I want to make something very plain. When I say Roman Catholicism, I'm not talking about Catholics. 
I'm sure that 99% of Catholics don't know anything about this deeper teaching of Roman Catholicism. If they knew, they would be as appalled as was Martin Luther. And the same with the Protestants. That's if we sh you're showing how you can be part of Babylon without, knowing without even knowing it. Absolutely. So he qualifies it by continuing speaking lies and hypocrisy. We've just dealt with a lot of lies. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, they're not even ashamed of it. Forbidding to marry. Commanding to abstain from meats, foods, in other words, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, so this organization that he's referring to, that is preaching the doctrines of devils, I mean, this is called serpent theology, yeah? this lecture, right? And we've seen the serpent theology in the official documents of the Roman Catholic Church. So they're speaking lies because the devil told the lies. Jesus said the devil was a liar from the beginning and he was a murderer from the beginning. He is the father of lies. Having their consciences seared as with a hot iron, they don't even bother about it, forbidding to marry. Which ecclesiastical body forbids its ecclesia to marry? The, the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church. So this applies to the Roman Catholic Church. Commanding to abstain from foods, meats, mm. which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Which ecclesiastical body has instituted specific fast days? Like Lent, for example. Mm. The, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church. Or in the old days when they enforced the abstinence of meat other than fish on a Friday, etc., etc., etc. This is not to con be confused with the health message. Nothing to do with the health message. This, these are criteria of the doctrines of devils. devils. I mean, God gave a health message. Yes. Obviously, that's not a doctrine of devils, Correct. right? No, this has to do with an ecclesiastical mindset where they lie to you, where their conscience is totally seared because they accept any norms of society above that of the Bible. They forbid their ecclesia to marry and they can command feast days and fast days according to their whim. Mm. Let's take another example. 1 Corinthians 9.27 the King James Version here says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So what, what Paul is saying is, I have control over my body. I will determine what goes into my mouth. I will determine what comes out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. I will determine how I uh, deal with my sexuality. I am in command. Uh, I always put it succinctly and say, God put the head on the top. Everything else is that is lower than the head is subservient to the yeah. head. <laughs> but now look how the NIV, based on, of course, the manuscripts that they so love, states it. No, I strike a blow to my body. He never said that. He said, I keep under my body. I keep it in subjection to my mind. But no, here it says, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Or well, here's the World English Bible. But I beat my body and bring it into submission for fear that by any means that after I've preached to others I myself should be rejected. Or here in 1 Corinthians 9 27, I chastise my body. This is the Douay Rhymes, the Jesuit, Jesuit Bible. Bible. I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, etc. So this is in line with what we've seen that they will actually change the Bible in order to suit their doctrine. So do they do this? Absolutely. Why do some Catholics self-flagellate? So they beat themselves in these rituals 
until they are bleeding. And uh, the magazine answers is the BBC News. The late Pope John Paul II would whip himself, according to a nun who helped to look after him. So how common is this practice in the Catholic faith? Martin Luther, when he was a Catholic, used to beat himself. And this is not biblical. But this is how you can distort the scripture. Then it becomes a salvation by works. Nowhere did God require this from anyone. Mm. Nowhere in the scripture. Now, the most serious one, as far as I'm concerned, is the issue of the atonement. Mm. You know what? The issue of the atonement is such an important issue. It's the very heart of the gospel. It's the plan of salvation. I think we should discuss that in another session. Yes, I agree with you. So let's pray. Thank you. pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. We pray that you bless all the viewers and all the listeners and also bring us together again for another discussion. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.